Welcome back to another episode of Shedding 30 with me, your host, Carla Wilmaris. And this week we have in the studio as a friend of the podcast, Melody Shakia. Hey, hey, yep, Melody yeah. Shakia. <laughs> <laughs> she is here. As you guys mentioned, I had been looking for a, a specific type of guest and I found her. But before we get into why she's here, we're going to go into the segment Shit You Should Know. And recently we just had, what is it called, Cyber Monday? Mm-hmm. And I did a little shopping, not too much because, you know, I ain't got no job. So I need to, you know, be careful with how much money I spent. And I, I saved my money. And Cyber Monday was not part of my budget, but I did buy some things. And I saw that Supercent. Do you know who she is? Su- say it again. Supercent. I don't no. know who she was either. But no. there is this makeup. I don't know how much you are into makeup called the Crayon Box. And she created this makeup a couple years back. And she used to bus tables, clean hotel rooms. So she's been doing very well with it. Mm-hmm. She sold a million. She grossed a million dollars in 90 minutes. Oh, my goodness. On Cyber Monday. It was so good to watch. Because I watched the video. And it showed how it was just going. Like, her phone just kept going with orders and orders. And this is just what she started doing, you know. And it was her wow. calling. It was She worked really hard for it. She didn't come from anything to just do it. Like she said, she bus tables. She mm-hmm. cleaned hotel rooms. She did the work behind it to be able to support what she wanted to do in her mm-hmm. dream. And she did it. And now she's, like, living her purpose. Basically, she's like, don't give up. And she's encouraging others to do it. But I thought it was amazing. That is awesome. You know, I'm not, I'm, I, have to, I, have to, I have to go look her up because I've never heard of her. What's her name again? Supercent. <laughs> yeah, so it's S U P A and then Cent. Okay. Yeah, like fifty cent, but super okay. cent. So she okay. came apparently back from the Vine days and making videos mm-hmm. and all this stuff. But listen, shout out to her, and she's a woman of color. She is a black nice. woman, so I was just like, this is amazing that you know women and women of color are getting the shine and they're getting the recognition yes. in business because we know yeah. what we're doing. And yeah. a lot of these men sometimes are like, oh, you know, you guys should just sit down and work and be housewives. I don't know about you, but I can't be a housewife. <laughs> you know, I can work within the house. I don't have to go to a nine to five job. Oh, I correct. I can stay home and work. Yeah. Right, like I am here. Yeah, I can stay home, definitely. That's it, but I'm, well, <laughs> I don't like staying home either. I have to at least be with people, so I'm bringing the people here. Like, you're here with me and I get to talk to you, so it's not like I'm really home. Yeah. But cleaning, I don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-mm. I have a cleaning lady, and actually she's gone right now this month. Like, who told her she can take a vacation? So she went back home to Columbia, and I'm stressed. So I have to buy extra <laughs> underwear. Because when you are not in underwear, then you have to wash them. And I don't wash my clothes. See, I have to clean. I don't mind cleaning. Mm -mm. I do not mind cleaning. I hate it. So that's what I have a child for. (laughs) You know, it was part of her purpose in life. Oh, you know what? That's true. true. (laughs) Well, anyways, I have you here. I went online and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about next. What's the next guest that I wanted to have on? And I said, I want something different. What haven't I talked about? Who haven't I talked about? What kind of person have I not met? And I thought about, shit, I'm 30. Are there any virgins left? Someone had written, I think it was on Facebook or on Instagram, and I said, I want, I bet you there's no virgins left past 25. And then somebody said, <laughs> shit, past 18. And I was like, well, you know, you might be right. Because nowadays these kids in high school, they getting down. Oh, in yeah. middle school. At, I have, younger, at younger ages, middle school, yeah. Yes, I have a friend. Yeah. I think she, did, she was a teacher in elementary school, and she told me, like, kids in elementary school even. My daughter had a girl that was sending nudes in the fourth mm-hmm. grade. Well, not mm-hmm. my, that I worded that really wrong. My daughter's school had a girl mm-hmm. that was sending them and My friend's son's son saw them and she told me about it. And I was like, well, you can't be friends with her because she's going to be a, she's just no good. Mm-hmm. If she's doing it now, I mean, I send my nudes every once in a while, but I'm grown paying my own bills and I'm a grown woman to my boyfriend, you know? Back in the, uh, we're not going to talk about but that. But kids are doing the same thing to their boyfriend. But children, yeah, middle school, like yeah. I'm talking about children. You don't mm-hmm. even have no titties, little girl. Like you got, there's nothing there, and your underwear are from like Fruit of the Looms or whatever it's called, Fruit Loops. I don't know what they're called from Walmart. <laughs> like, come on, girl, stop. But anyways, um, so I'm writing on, and I got on to. I don't know if you knew, but there is, or if anyone knew, there's like a Match.com or a dating website for virgins. Oh, really? Right. So I went on live. I went on live and I said, okay, well, maybe I can do it with people with me. So I had to set up a profile Mm -hmm. and I set up a profile. And then when I get to it, it says, are you a virgin or non-virgin? I said, oh, shit. So I guess non-virgins going on there, like men or women to look for a virgin. And Mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, this is, I mean, I've heard it costs a lot of money to take somebody. So I guess they're getting a couple of dollars or maybe another virgin wanted to meet another virgin. Okay, cool. So I put that I was a virgin on it. And I didn't put a picture, so I wanted to, like, search people in Orlando. And I found mm-hmm. a few, but it was just, that was just it. They were a virgin. I'm like, what's the big deal about being a virgin? Okay, you just haven't had sex. Big deal. Then, Shaquana, 
a friend of mine, she said, I have somebody for you. I said, girl, who do you know? Come on now. You know we don't know nobody. Like, stop playing with me. She goes, actually, my cousin. And I said, why are you lying? You know you don't have a cousin. That's a virgin. She's like, no, I really do. Do you remember? From I said, oh, yeah, but I thought when she said your name, I thought of your sister. Mm-hmm. And She'll I said, the one who right. About to say but I said, don't like she me. have kids? Does she have kids? She does have kids, she right? She has four kids, yeah. Yeah, she has mm-hmm. kids, and she was married before. I remember there was a mm-hmm. wedding at she's one point married. in time. Mm-hmm. Right, so I said, oh, come on now. You're, she's, how are you going to tell me she's a virgin? Born again virgin, you mean? Like, I wasn't looking for a born again virgin. I was looking for a virgin virgin. She goes, no. My cousin, her sister, I said, oh, okay. Then I said, well, I wonder how she knows that. I've never even told her that. Have you talked about it before? Uh, I probably have. I did another interview. I probably didn't mention it. Have I'm you like, mentioned it on Facebook or something? I did another interview on Facebook, uh, um, a live. Maybe I mentioned it, mentioned it then. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so okay. she mentioned it, and I said, oh, okay, but... Then I was like, ah, well, what does she have to say? She's like, well, I'm going to just send you her page and you're going to look through it. So when I looked, I saw your book. Mm -hmm. And I said, ooh, she got shit to say. And she's, you know, (laughs) she got, she has a story. She has something behind it. Mm -hmm. So, and you're very different from me. Although we have the same upbringing of coming from the church, we took different paths. And I said, well, you know what, her story, she already talks about what she's got going on. And from this, we come into your, a book that you wrote, Mm -hmm. you wrote called Life After Freedom. Yes. So yeah. I said, well, but what freedom? She was in jail. That's the first thing I thought. So I thought you went to jail and then came out and it was, you were talking about the freedom of jail. And then I saw that it wasn't. So basically <laughs> let's go into you and tell me like where you're from, how old you are and a little bit of your background. All right. So I was born and raised in Orlando, Florida. You don't see so. that often. Born huh? and raised here. You don't see it often. Like everybody is a transplant. Like, but I was born and raised here. Um, three sisters. Of course, you know, my cousin, mm-hmm. Um, I did move for about a year to Tennessee to kind of dive into the music industry, came back, but, um, I am 35 years old and yeah. So my testimony is that the Lord delivered me from a pornography addiction that, and it was an eight year long, um, addiction and I tried everything to get free of it and, you know, all sorts of, you know, just the prayer and all of that and just kind of wondering like, like, okay, Lord, like, why can I get free from this? Because a lot of people see it as like a, many people don't even think there's anything wrong with it. But I know for me, it, it was really destructive. You spoke, but you said it's an addiction. It was a real, what I used to It was a book. real live addiction. Right. That's what I would say it was. You, you know. sent me your book. I would say it's an addiction. Because mm-hmm. if you yeah. spent a couple of pennies on it. So mm-hmm. one, you were, you're in the church. You had yeah. an addiction, mm-hmm. regardless of what it was, and which we'll talk about it. It was an addiction. Now, there was one thing that I said, I'm going to have to ask, and you did tell me, I don't like speaking about the fact that I'm a virgin, but be- this is probably the one thing I'm going to ask. Are you a virgin virgin? Yes. A real life gold star virgin? Yes. Because that's another thing <laughs> I got from when I was, I, I have a, a, a little bit dirty mouth. I'm sorry. Well, I'll repent later. Uh, when I was talking about it, they'd be like, oh, I'm a virgin, but I've had oral sex. Or mm. I'm a virgin or only because my hymen stole that, but I don't got some booty play. Mm. Or, <laughs> like, or, you know, there's all these different things. So you're a yeah. virgin virgin. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Now that we got that out of the way, she's a very real guy. It's real. <laughs> not like you hoes out there getting all kinds, like finger main and then the booty and talking about you're a virgin. No, you're not. No, you're not. This It's for real. So anywho, you sent me your book mm-hmm. and I read it. And well, I didn't finish, but I got all the way to like, starting when your life after everything happened yeah so let's talk about how you were introduced because you said you were eight years old i was eight years old when you were first introduced to porn um at a family member's house we just found it at a family member's house one of my sisters found it and she was like hey come look at this and we're kids we don't know it was a video or a magazine it was a video it was a video so we kind of like snuck and watch it and stuff like that so like the images always stayed in my head all throughout like childhood middle school high school so, yeah, so I was exposed at a really young age. And at that time, I knew nothing about like sex or love or anything. So I loved reading that part because my first exposure to porn was at nine. Mm-hmm. I was in Puerto Rico and a friend of mine had it in. We have like carports like the one I have. And mm-hmm. it was a TV that her dad used to keep outside. And she's like, oh, yeah, I want to watch something. And it was porn. Mm-hmm. And I remember that. But I didn't become addicted to porn. I remember mm-hmm. seeing it again. Um, I think my dad, my parents in Puerto Rico had cable. And back in the day, you can just read their channels that mm-hmm. had it. And you turn it on and it's just like, whoa, mm-hmm. this, you know, ball out. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So what made what was the difference between, let's say me at I was nine when the first time I saw porn to you 
when you saw porn, what happened? What led to it? I know you've mentioned your father mm-hmm. being around. There was different things and you blaming it on certain things. But mm-hmm. what is your story behind from when you saw it at eight to becoming an addiction? I would say, hmm. There was always like a void with my father, like not being around, but I would not blame it on that. Um, I think everybody makes their own choices. I think that's the thing with addictions. People like to try to put the blame on something. I think there are definitely reasons. So I would say there was a definitely a void with him not being there. I was looking for love. And was he never there? So my parents got divorced at eight and like a few months later I was exposed to it. So, um, yeah. So he just kind of left and kind of faded out of picture. We didn't see him a whole lot. Um, so when I turned 22, my sister and I moved out, got our own place and I had privacy and really how I got into it was through joining the chat rooms, you know, back then like chat rooms, the really AOL big. chat rooms, yeah, the AOL chat rooms. Yeah, and I, I forgot those. the name of the name of this one, but it was like an adult chat room where they talked about, um, racial issues and all sorts of issues. I was in right? my, my scream of spicy jalapeno. <laughs> I don't know. That's a funny name. <laughs> I still to this day have like a little chili pepper on my Instagram to this day. That seems like you. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, so I was really into that because I am very opinionated. So I, and I love to write. So I like to, and I was kind of introverted. That's the thing. I was very introverted, always to myself, always on the computer, kind of like a computer nerd. So um, yeah, they talked about different topics, and I explored different uh, forums within the chat room, and I've kind of migrated over to like the more of the X-rated forums where they were so talking which about did you start things. with. Um, one of them was talking about like sex positions and stuff like that, stuff that I was very curious about. And being that I grew up in the church, I knew like that all of this stuff, you know, in the eyes of God, was was wrong or like territory that I shouldn't really be digging into. But I was just really curious. So from eight to twenty-two. You didn't look at it from eight to 22. We will find magazines here and there, but from eight to 22, no, I, I wasn't. You weren't wasn't curious it. about it. You weren't looking for it. I was curious about it. It was always in my mind. Like those images was always like in my mind. So, so you I would was, think about it, but you weren't searching for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 22, you and I just didn't have access to it to be honest with you. It's not like it is today. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. All right. I mean, yeah. that makes, well, so 22, we're, you're what? Three, four years older than me. That was, we had phones. We um, had computers. I got like, okay, so the computer I got at home, we were at home. So it was like a family computer. Okay. Like, yeah. So you were scared. Somebody's going to find it. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't get really get my own computer until I was like 22. Okay. Perfect. And then we moved out. And so I had that privacy and I was always very curious about it. Okay. So now um, you left, excuse me, mm-hmm. that the, the cool chat rooms that were just positions and talking about, mm-hmm. it was probably like that. You know, remember the white lady that talked on TV about sex health? The old white lady. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about? I know who you're talking I, about. Damn it, I can't remember her name. I can't think of her name. She she yeah. was good though. She came on around 11 o'clock, mm-hmm. 12 o'clock. She was out oh, while I think I saw her. a few of her shows back in the day. Yeah, so yeah. it was that kind of chat rooms at first. Uh, no, not even that sophisticated. That's the thing. Oh. Like, these people were just, like, grungy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were just a mess. So, and I was very curious and, like, interacting with them and stuff like that. And like I said, initially, it was just about, like, racial issues and issues like that. But then it turned into more of, like, you know, things that were more X-rated. And I kind of, I knew in my heart I felt, like, convicted about going that route and digging into those subjects. You felt like it was wrong. I felt like it was wrong. But um, still did it because I was curious. And, of course, like, no one in my family ever talked about it. Of course, they didn't talk about it at church. That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, who talks about porn? I mean, nowadays I feel like people do, but back then it's just, it's a taboo Even, even nowadays people really don't. And if they do, they kind of, they kind of, uh project it towards the men because no one assumed that women are really into it like that they assume that but it's a it's a big misconception for sure mm-hmm. and i feel like it's with sex being so much more open nowadays mm-hmm. and it's like the it's time for women for women to talk about what they like and what they don't like i think it's a lot mm-hmm. more open now so once you get into that chat room you, you discover what what's because i've never been in i didn't you, go into well i discovered rooms. like they were posting like pictures and things like that so cl- of course when you click on the pictures you go like straight to the website okay. and that's pretty much what happened i started like clicking on the pictures going to the website viewing the pictures there and then people po- post videos and at first it wasn't an addiction it was more like something like a pastime type mm-hmm. of thing um but the more i dug into it the more i kind of got like hooked on hooked on it and um to be honest with you i didn't know i had a problem until you know, these viruses, basically. So I read that. got a virus, so I had to go get it fixed. 
And then when it happened two more times, and I was like really trying to stop, I'm like, I'm giving my computer viruses, but I just could not stop. It was expensive back in the day to get them it was, fixed. It no, really not was. many people knew how to do it. Yeah. And you know, these Apple computers don't really get viruses like that. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't have Apple. Wait. So, oh, you had a PC. I had a PC. Every other week there was something in it. Yeah. And I wasn't even looking at it. I don't know what going, the hell I was looking yeah, at. Especially but they're going, pop-ups. Yeah, especially pop ups. They're pop ups, so you're going to get them. So that's when I really realized, okay, I think I have like a real problem because I'm paying out all this money to fix this computer like every month. You know, and you said that there was at one point you you were showed up, I guess the same guy you were going to to get your virus fixed and he knew something. And was after up. While he was looking at me like and I was trying to pretend like I didn't know why I was getting this virus. But of course, he's fixing it. So he knows what's going he's on. He's seeing your history. Yeah. Oh, so, so he, he was, knows your freaky history now. Pop, that's how I felt. We're going to call him Tyrone. So Tyrone walked in and then come out. Here come Melody again. I'm about to see yeah, what she's so, looking at. And that was the thing. So at that point, like the look he gave me, I was like, you know what? I think I have like a, a true lie problem, you know? Um, yeah. So from then that point, and that was 22 years old. Okay. So from that point, I knew I had a problem and that it was like, okay, I have to make a decision. Like, do I tell somebody about this? Do I get prayer? Like, what do I do? And of course, I was not going to do that. I was not ready to do that because who am I going to tell? Right. You know what I'm saying? You mentioned on there, which is a big thing for me because I did grow up in the church and mm-hmm. I got pregnant at 17. I had my daughter at 18 and mm-hmm. I've spoken about this on the show before. I feel like I was shunned from the church. I used to be in the dance ministry, so I would travel mm-hmm. and I dance and I, I was worshiping priests, as it's called. And once I had my daughter, it was like, oh, a baby having a baby. But so mm. judgmental. And I am, I do believe in God. I'm a very spiritual person. I'm not a religious person, though. Mm. So growing up in the church made me feel like like my grandfather was a pastor. I, I, there's so many pastors in my family. And my mother's still very much into the church, which, but she's very religious. One of the reasons why I don't speak to her. Because um, the judgment mm. that I received from the church was bullshit. And I'm like, I'm a good person. I don't do, I'm such an open bug. Some people, I think that's why I'm, I've, this has taken off for me the way that it has. I'm transparent. Mm-hmm. I'm not ashamed of That's anything that thing. I did. Yeah. I had my daughter at 17. What can I do? I chose to be a mother. I went to college, then I stopped, and I decided to take care of my daughter first. Mm-hmm. Then I went back and finished for I did all these things, and it was still like I wasn't good enough to some people mm-hmm. that are from the what I'll say, quote unquote, church, because I don't feel like they are the mirror image of God or Jesus. So when I'm reading your book, you were terrified. To go to anyone in the church. And it seems like you were very involved in that dang church. I, I was very involved. Like, I was involved because I'm on praise and worship because I'm also, like, a singer and all of that. So I was on the praise and worship team and any other ministry they had I was on. I rem- didn't you Everybody have, like, a group? Your, the three sisters would yeah. sing? I remember that And we were singing at that time. We were singing, going out, doing shows, talking about Jesus and stuff like that. I love the Lord. I just had a problem. And the thing is, I think a lot of church people sometimes – I don't know why. I don't know why that why that is, but they put forth this image of oh, you have to be perfect when everybody knows everybody's struggling with something. The pastor probably messing with the, the you know, secretary. It happens all the time. I mean, we. I think I'm there's, not your pastor. I'm just yeah, saying. I mean, there's a standard. We should all have a standard, something to um, you know, we we all want to be like Christ. We all want to follow. You but know, we the are word. human. Yeah, but we yeah we do make mistakes and we fall and we have to even when our brother or sister falls, we have to love them. To help them to get it together, not shun them. So I was, I did feel like I was going to be shunned and maybe talked about. And that was that specific church that I was going through because I saw how they handled other people who had right, fallen. You said that the moment you said something, everybody was going to know your business. Everybody was going to, yeah. And that happens a lot. And I'm sorry. Like I knew like at that particular church, I'm like, okay, this church, you know, you're supposed to cover people and make sure they're, you know. Feel protected all, and protected. feel loved and not judged. This church, I knew that was not going to happen, unfortunately. And that's the thing about trying to get help. You really have to know who to tell because you don't want to. There was something else you injury, said in injury. the book, and it was that the church said this. I was like, oh, she was in a cult. That wasn't no church. When they said that you couldn't leave the church without the pastor's blessing or something along those lines. It was a name for it. What yeah. was it? Covenant. You can't break Who's covenant? covenant? For what covenant? Who's covenant who? <laughs> What does that mean now? Uh, okay, so you have some churches around here and around the world. You know, they believe that um, you have a covenant with the church instead of like, we. I know that your covenant is with God. It's mm-hmm. not like with the church. Um, but some people believe that your covenant is with the church. And if you leave the church, you're breaking like a contract, basically. Oh. So that's what this particular church. So they don't want to lose your 10 percent. Basically. <sighs> Probably. <laughs> and, you know, so, Yeah. But see, that's why I got out of that church. So how did you do it? Because in the book, what I'm reading, you seem like you're very, you're scared to leave because of it. You're scared you'll lose 
I don't know, maybe your touch with God or you were breaking or making or something so, bad would happen. Cause that's right, what we were I, that's told. Some, yes. Yeah. What, like what? You're going to blow up and fire or something. I don't know. Just something bad. A disease something or about, just something bad. What happened? A disease. Oh, yeah. God damn. So I wanted to get out of the church for like two whole years, my sister and I and everything, but it was just the fear and the, um, the mind control, the brainwashing and all yeah, that. Yeah. Damn cold. Yeah. They still are. Poor, poor people. Don't, um, we'll, we won't talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Cause we are in the same So, city. So yeah, how did you so leave? Basically, because now you're ha- you have an issue, and you realize like yeah, and I'm like okay, I want to get help, but I knew I couldn't get help there, and I know every church is not like that. So I was like okay, I have to get out of this church. So we started visiting other. Ch- oh, we'll be praying for you. Like they couldn't really hold me accountable, and they didn't really think it was like a big deal. Oh, okay. To that extent. Now you decide to switch churches, mm-hmm. and yeah. you find this church and the pastor that you say that is the perfect one. You said that church ended up being in the same building same. that the fifty dollars you found. Yes. So, so the Publix. Yeah. So Publix that is gone. That used to be a Publix. So I remember we were just going to me and my sister was going to get some Chinese food from that same um, shopping center that day, and I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta pee. So I went over to the Publix, um, and on the way out, that's when I found fifty dollar bill. Then they tore that Publix down, and it sat there empty for about two or three years. And then this church was built, and I remember hearing about this church, and, you know, there was a really good church. Went over there, um, joined the church and everything, and it was probably about a year or two later that I realized, oh, my God, this is the same place that I found this $50 bill. This used to be the Publix. Now, I asked you, I think I just asked you before, you said you used to watch porn every day. Once a day? Um, Because I would say some people that say smoke weed, Mm -hmm. they smoke once a day. They can probably stop. Yeah. How often and for how long did so you watch it would, this? Okay, so really anytime I was alone most of the time. Um, and at night, it would be for hours. Sometimes I would go for like five, six hours. like Hours? Yeah, hours. Like the sun would be coming up. Well, damn. Yeah, see, so here's I, my thing. Yeah. I'll watch porn every once in a while. My boyfriend's not here. I'll, actually, I don't really watch it with him too much. I'm like, if he's not here, I need a quick two minutes. And that's all I need. If that. Mm-hmm. Two minutes. And then afterwards, I'm like, all right, psh, bye, shut off. And I'm like hours when i've read about addiction to porn i'm like what how hours. many positions can you really have there's i mean so i guess many, there's a lot there's so many genres so and then the, i think the thing is too i will say this for people who are trying to um either if you're a virgin or living a celibate life i think sometimes if you're in a church you feel like okay so i'm not actually doing it so i can just watch the pornography because i'm not actually doing it so, that so i would, think it was more like a, a way to medicate that um, that, that stuck out yeah. to me because mm-hmm. as me growing up in the church and you being so submerged into the church and still like a, a hardcore believer, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if hardcore is the right word, but like a believer, mm-hmm. um, a sin is a sin. All sins are equal. Mm-hmm. So you're like, okay, I won't have, were you not, were you holding on to your virginity or you st- or because of the church or was it just, it didn't happen or it hadn't happened? Um, it's not that it did, couldn't happen or whatever, but. Because you're a beautiful a, girl. I can see you. how guys want to be like, hey, girl, you know, I love you. Come on, let me and get that. I had a lot you of know? that. You know what? That was a commitment that I made when I was 12. Okay, so you did it I made like a church. straight up commitment. I was like, Lord, well, really because of God, not even really because of the church. I just remember making a commitment like, Lord, I'm going to stay a virgin until I get married. So oh, that's what one. I mean by church is like this, because of your spiritual belief. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so what was the difference in your mind? How were you saying, okay, well, I'd rather have or rather commit this sin of porn instead mm-hmm. of the sin of sex. Cause I mean, to me, I'm like, man, I'm already sinning. I might as well get me a couple of dicks down. Excuse me. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like it's, 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 it's a sin. A sin is a sin. So I might as well mm-hmm. get off with a person instead of being addicted because I feel like an addiction, regardless of it being born, crack, meth, mm-hmm. like anything. Sex is an addiction. Yeah. All these addictions are all the same. You say you can't sleep. You're mm-hmm. tired. Your spirit is low. Like mm-hmm. it's, you, it, it takes a toll on you. you. Yes, it drains you. Yes. And it can even make you like sick. I think at the time it was just a deception. Like, I just figured, okay, so I'll do this. And I knew it was wrong. Actually, I knew it was just as wrong. But I had already, I was already hooked by then. And um, so it was never a thing of, okay, I'll do this instead of that. At first it was. That's what I tried to tell myself. But I knew that it was wrong. And in a way, I almost felt like it was, like, worse. Because I felt like I was opening myself up to so many other, like, spirits. Like, I'm really into, like, right. the spiritual realm and the things that you're opening yourself up to. Was there anything um, in specific that you would watch? There was no question that I received and they're like, was, is there, mm-hmm. when you're a sex or uh, a porn addict, is there a specific genre that you go for? Or is it all of them? I would say it's definitely not all of them. Oh my God. No. Um, there's some I'm, weird shit out there. This, yeah. So 
I would say at the time, um, in my early 20s, I was really hurting because my dad wasn't there. So I had, like, a lot of anger. So I naturally migrated towards, um, I don't know if you heard of, like, the BDSM, uh-huh. bondage and, and submission. So I, I migrated towards that because it was, like, more of an angry vibe. Um yeah, were well they like, like there was like like, yeah. like extreme BDSM or like I just want to get slapped because I saw that you put on, on an expert it said BDSM is evil, mm-hmm. and I said well I like to get slapped sometimes a little choke here and there you know not a problem, so was is that evil and I was married for a long time with my daughter's dad mm-hmm. and I did it then I was like well I even did it with my husband so under the eyes of God, it was okay I just liked it I didn't want to get hurt or get killed or anything and not to the extreme mm-hmm. but it's was it an extreme BDSM of like what they almost died or it just, I would say it started out as just oh, slapping, whatever. But I feel like with anything, there's always a progression. Uh-huh. So yes, it ended up very extreme. Of course, you know, nobody died or anything like that, but it would end up very extreme. And I think the thing, even when with married couples, I think with stuff like that, it kind of gets to a point like where, like, where does it end? Like if you open one door, you get bored with that. I would imagine you kind of get bored with that. So it, you always want to progress. So it gets to a point of like, okay, where does it end? Nah. You no? can't choke me too far. <laughs> no. So I, that, but, I, but you know what? That's for you, but you may not know what's going on in his mind. That's I, I'm sorry, like you may it better not come out in that hand though. That's all I know. The slap better not go too hard. And see, that's the thing. <laughs> I feel like fight. especially with men, men are, they're different. Like I think women's like when we are addicted to things like that or into stuff like that, we know how to put limits on certain things. But as far as a man, I don't really think they do. I think at some point they kind of want to progress naturally. I think that is something, and that's an issue I have with the church, and that is putting those limitations on men and women on mm. what we are. It's like men are just naturally rough. Men are beasts. Men can't control themselves. Yes, they can. They and can, like but many of them too. There's yeah. women the same way. So when mm-hmm. when you say that, it reminds me of when I was in the church. And it's like you need to be as women. We need to be, you know, dressed this way or mm-hmm. conduct ourselves this way because the men are savages. And you know, a man will want you. Well, mm-hmm. I want him too. You know what I'm saying? What's mm-hmm. the difference between a woman and a man? I he looks good. I'm looking at him the same way he's looking at me. So yeah. what makes us different than a man? So a man can, act, there's men that are more emotional than women. So I feel like yeah. it's 50-50 with everything. But we're training our boys mm-hmm. to think as men. And I think the church trains our boys, some, I'll say some churches, not all. Mm-hmm. Some, they're training the boys to think that they're like animalistic, that they can't control themselves and telling girls, you need to watch what you do because he's going to be a man and he, or he's a boy. And he's going to want this and he can't control himself. I, so, don't, I mean, I think there is some truth to that. I don't think they're animal. I wouldn't say they're animalistic or anything like that. But I do feel like um, men are very visual creatures. I think that um, if they if they watch pornography, they're going to want to go it, do it. Where, versus a woman, it's more like fantasy for us. So I think a lot of it is not that they're like... But women they, they want to go do it too. Some, like, honestly, I didn't. That's the thing, like... like and I'm not saying every man is that way, but mm-hmm. for the most part... Most men, they want to do whatever it is they're watching. I mean, that's... I don't think that has to do with... I, that that know? one will just agree to disagree because to me, no. When I want to do something, I do it. Mm-hmm. Like, period, point blank. Like, there's been times when my boyfriend, he's like, I don't think you should do that. I, said, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm... I And I've always been that way. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Mm-hmm. And that it, I've checked to see if any balls grew with none. <laughs> like they're not there and <laughs> like i'm still a woman my daddy told me like you should have been growing a woman i mean a man but there's so many other women like that mm-hmm. and i feel like there are some that grew up not or being taught like you don't go towards your impulses or women like you need to be reserved and i think it has to do with I think the way everybody that should have that standard i don't think there should be I don't, doing I, what you want not doing what you want, but I think um, everybody should have a certain standard. Like, for example, if, if they tell women to dress modestly, men need to dress modestly. Right. Well. Men I mean, out here with their titties out. Why yeah, can't I wear mine? I mean, because we're not blind. I'm not blind. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. But at the same time, I don't think it should be like a, a religious thing. Like, oh, no, your, your, skirt should, your skirt should be down to your leg. You know what I'm saying? And they should be black. And this, uh, you yeah, know, no, I'm not with all that. And like, tell girl, her, yeah, is that yeah. Pentecostal, I think? Or That's, she used to wear only skirts. She just started wearing jeans i think maybe in the last 
<laughs> 10 years maybe she's 85 oh wow she had i remember going into her closet and it was all black skirts see that to me that's just religion and one thing about me i'm not religious that's why i'm here now because i'm not religious i'm not down with you know with just religion Being i don't told think what God, to do you're reading yeah. the bible you believe certain spiritual things there is you believe in a higher I, or i do i believe in a mm-hmm. higher being i believe in being a good person mm-hmm. i believe that yes if i do something wrong i can pray and i'll, I'll do pray and i'll say a lot of times i'll say thank you god because what i, I was able to quit my job you know, yes, and it wasn't just, yeah. hey, one day I woke up. No, I planned for it and I did. But with my mind, me being good to people has led me to where I am today. Mm-hmm. And I know that I'll, it'll keep growing. So with you, it's like you're saying you're a lot more into the church than I am because I don't want to deal with the people. But at the same time, I you say certain things like men are like this. And I'm like, mm, I feel like that's something we were taught because I was taught the same thing mm-hmm. growing up. Anywho, I saw something that you wrote. Oh, let's go back when you start. Let's, let's touch into when you went to your pastors. Because now you switched yeah. church. Yes. Now is the old church, the, the um, cult mad at you? Oh, the, yeah, they're mad. They're mad. I'm excommunicated, all of that. And I was at the time, I was like, I who don't Who communicated care. with who? What What did you get? Excommunicated. What does that mean? That means, like, okay, um, this person left the church, so don't talk to them. They're probably a bad influence. Yeah. Oh, so now, now they can. That church tells people who to talk to and who not to talk to. Oh yeah, that's the kind of church that was. Um, yeah. Or your parents? I was watching. It was like the craziest thing. I was watching a Lifetime movie, mm-hmm. and the couple in the Lifetime movie they they watch porn together all the time or whatever, and the man ended up cheating. Oh yes, girl, I remember the story. Go ahead, cause I like. Yes, that. and that's a true story. Okay, right. Yeah, so they was like really just freaky into all kind of stuff, and um, I guess he wanted somebody else to whatever. That's see. That's what I mean when I say where does it end? Because at some point somebody's gonna be like, okay, yeah, maybe should we should do a twosome now? Okay, maybe a threesome, foursome. At some point somebody's gonna go go out and do some more. Mm-hmm. So he went and cheated on her, or whatever. So she killed him. Um, and I just remember like watching his lifeless body on in at, in the shower. He was dead in the shower. I don't know why. Like a thought in my head was like, okay, this is this is gonna be you. This is you. And I was just like, so and I knew you dead. It, yeah. Of porn. Yeah, and it, it could have been maybe, and a, it was very like extreme. I was kind of like, and then I felt something tell me like not physically, like you're physically gonna die, but it's just death. your spiritual. He's yeah. like, like this is basically you in the spirit, and this is your life right now. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to. I really felt like at that moment I needed to reach out and get help, and it was around like one a.m. in the morning. Um, so yeah, I reached. You were watching out. a lifetime movie at one a.m. Not porn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I wrote my pastor's wife on Facebook. And I just wrote this long letter. I was like, you know, I'm addicted to pornography. I really need help. Um, she wrote me back and was like, okay, we'll set up a meeting, you know, whatever. And, yeah, so she set up a I – call, I called the office that next day. And they set up a meeting for, like, two weeks off. So right then and there, I'm like – Were okay. they older? Yeah, don't, yeah, they were, like, in their 50s, like, older okay. pastors, which I liked. It's like they had seen it all. Like, nothing was, like, a big well, deal to them. 50s is not too bad. Almost, like, like late 50s. How like, old are you at this point? I was 29. Okay. 29. Um, yeah. And still a virgin. Had not tried anything. Yeah. So you go into this. What do you tell them? How how do you feel like they helped you stop? Because if you tried for it, now it's been, what, seven years? Mm-hmm. From 22 to 29. Seven years. And you tried and mm-hmm. you tried everything you said. Everything. You tried yeah. everything and nothing lasted more than two weeks. Yeah. So how much. now going to this pastor or, or the pastor's wife, mm-hmm. how did that stop you? What did they say that was different than what you were doing before you know what i think it was just the fact of um telling someone telling someone that i was afraid to tell i think when it comes to certain things like addictions like that the okay so i feel like spiritually speaking i feel like the enemy has a hold on you when you keep everything when you keep it a secret you know like i feel like the addiction thrives in secrecy Mm -hmm. so i was like i'm gonna tell the the people that i would be most afraid to tell you know, I'm just going to put it out there. Spiritually that way, but just within the world, you have no one to hold you accountable. Mm-hmm. So if you keep it a secret, it's just like, no, well, nobody knows. Nobody it's, knows. If you slip up, you no one knows. Going. So now yeah. you opened up and it's out there. Yeah. So um, I did go. So I met with the pastor's wife first. Like I met with her in the room first. And I told her, um, and she she straight up from off the bat, she was like, anything you tell me is cool. I'm not going to think any differently of you right so i went ahead and just opened up and told i was like okay i'm addicted to pornography and i don't know how to stop and all of this and i was in there crying and everything and she you know she was it was kind of shocking she was like okay what kind do you watch and i'm like (laughs) 
I'm like, uh, I'm looking like, do you really want to know? Like, I'm not finna, you know. I don't so want to go. Say, yeah. BDSM? No, <laughs> I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I'm heterosexual. I just kept it right on the surface. Oh. So I'm like, I'm not finna go into all these because she was like, oh, what kind do you watch? And I was like, like, what kind of question is that? Maybe you, she was probably trying to, you know, say see if you like the same thing she like. She could have like, you know, y'all would have had something in common and talked about it for no, a little bit. I doubt. I, I don't know why she asked that question, but I was I, looking I'm at her like, you why she asked that question? She been watching porn with her husband. <laughs> She wanted, I don't, make, I don't she think wanted so, to Carla. make sure you weren't doing that. No, too, too crazy. Like, okay, I can help her with this. If you were doing I'm something like, like the nose or something, she would be like, I can't help her. That's like, more mental. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm not finna go into all different genres. She probably didn't even know nothing about it. I was like, heterosexual. Oh, she know. Ma- you know what? Maybe she that does because she's human. <laughs> okay. And she's probably seen it all. Right. You know, because they, they were really good with counseling. Because I remember from the from the stage, there was like, if anybody's going through anything, you can always come talk to us, set up a meeting. And that's really what made As it should be in the church. Yeah. Um, and like I said, they were very transparent with their past. So I didn't feel like I was going to be judged. So I spoke to her and then um, we went into the room and I had to repeat the same thing over again to her husband. Did he ask you what kind you watch? No, he didn't. But the first thing he said was, oh, well, you must like it. And I was like, um, no, nigga, I love it. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I was like, well, I do, but I really want to stop. He's like, no, you must, you must like your life the way it is. He's like, if you really want to stop something, you would stop. You know, he, mm-hmm. he was, I remember him telling me, okay, the devil's not making you put your hand on the computer and look up porn. He's not making, he's like, I understand where you're coming from. Um, and he said, even me as a man, he said, struggle for me too, to make sure I'm not doing nothing I shouldn't be doing. That's why I share offers with my wife. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm a, I'm human. But he's like, at the end of the day, it's like, I don't want you to have this mentality of, oh, the devil's making me do it. And, you know, I'm doing it because of my dad or I'm doing it because of this and that. He's like, no. We're taught that also in the church growing yeah. up. That the devil's yeah, making the you devil. do ABC. He was like, no. He's like, we're not going to do that. He's like, you need to really examine why you're doing what you're doing. And really, when you do this, really think about what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your soul. Are you upset about something? You know, are you frustrated about something? Um, so he really was like, you need to dive into basically like you said, therapy, like you need to really be diving into why you're doing what you're doing. But he said, of course, also we're going to pray, we're going to fast, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So they were very instrumental in helping me just like to see the light, you know, cause I think I had like this victim mentality and he was like, we're not going to do that because not the devil can't, God doesn't make us do anything. The devil can't make you're making you yourself anything. weaker. You're telling yourself you're weaker. Like mm-hmm. it's because of A, B, and C that I can't do this. My father is because um, mm-hmm. where I grew up. It's because of what I'm going on socially. That just mm-hmm. makes you think that you're weak. That so you're like, weak, I, and I that's what I thought. I'm like I can't, I can't stop. And he's like, you have, you got to stop saying you can't stop doing. You can stop doing whatever you want to stop doing. He's like, it's gonna be difficult because right. you didn't get into it in, in five minutes, so you're not gonna get out of it in five. I think that's another misconception. People think I'm gonna go to church, raise my hands, and God is just gonna deliver me from this, and I'm never gonna desire it again. And that's not realistic because you are because we all are human. We have fleshly desires and needs. You are going to desire it again. So how do you, how how often do you see them? Would you see them? Or was it just one time meeting and that's it? It was just that one time. I met with them one more time after that. Um, So just two times meeting with them. The rest you did it on your own. mm -hmm. So basically you had it in you to stop all along. Yeah. So do you say it was because of the pastors or was it because I actually you wouldn't, I would say they kind of helped me to get started on that journey of healing and deliverance just by talking to them and them giving me that straight talk, but in love, it was all in love though, but it was just straight talk. Right. As it should be. Yeah. So then I realized, okay, so at some point I'm going to have to really take responsibility for them. I'm going to have to read, read my word, pray fast. Um, How long do you fast for? Um, I would fast for like, sometimes I would do like just from like 6 a.m. to like 6 p.m. and stuff like that and pray. Ooh, um, I yeah. I real hungry. I can't fast. <laughs> I did the fast. Like that 40, what's the 40-day fast that comes in around like the beginning of the year? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Well, I Is it the, Dan- the Daniel fast? Yes. So I, but I did social media. <laughs> I know for a fact I'm addicted to my phone. But, I'm not getting rid of it. Just a little bit by a little bit. Like, no, you don't no. have, like he's not, God is not up there like, oh, you got to do a whole well, 40 days. I work days off no of my food. phone. And I work off, like, that's, and that's understandable. So now it's just like, ah, whatever. I know that certain times I have to put it down. So you met with them twice. Mm-hmm. And the rest, you did it on your own. The rest, I did it on my own, praying, fasting. Um, I Of course, I didn't just stop watching it overnight. Um, people would tell you that, and they're probably lying um, so with anything. It, it took about a good year to get to a point where I really just did not need it. Anymore. From 29 to 30. Mm-hmm. Where I just didn't, just didn't need it. 
Like I just, and I will say the word need because you feel like you need that it. Addiction. I just didn't need, need it. it. Yeah. Your mind is telling you if you don't get it, you're like, you can't keep functioning. Mm-hmm. So you, you feel like you're going to die. And it's like, like, there's a word that I hate when people say they're functional alcoholics or functional addicts. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Like that you can't really, you're not functioning at your full potential. You're not. When you're addicted to anything. Mm-hmm. Now, how long have you been, do you, is this considered sober? Um, <laughs> I how long I have guess. you been sober from <laughs> dangling on the television? <laughs> I would say maybe like five years. Five I would years. I'll say five years. Now um, my question to you it was, took about a year. And it's funny, guys, that like you're listening. So she comes in and she's like, when she sent me a message, she was running a little late, and I was like, Oh, that's fine. She's like, We will be there. I was like, Well, who the hell is she coming with? I didn't know. So you walk in here and I was like, Oh, she got her brother with her. I didn't know about a brother, I thought it was all sisters. <laughs> so they walk in. And my, one of my questions, which I'm looking at it, I'm like, so what does dating look like now? So I was like, oh, is this your brother? And you're like, she smiles. And you, you know, I'm like, oh, what is it? I'm like, oh, it's your boyfriend. Oh, it's a boyfriend, boyfriend. And my question <laughs> to you was going to be, what does dating look like now? Do you have to, like, I feel like crackheads and alcoholics and any addict of, or sex addicts have to sometimes disclose this to whoever they're dating because you should disclose it. Mm-hmm. So did you have, yeah. I was going to ask you, what does dating look like now? Um... It's easy when you have someone who is uh, walking down the same path you're walking, who believes the same thing you believe, who believes in waiting until marriage and stuff like that. Did so, you date during 22 to 30? I went out on dates and I had like really short relationships. What's short? Like three months. Oh. Yeah. But I, I was always dating, talking to guys and stuff like that. Um, but I kept them, kept them at a distance. Pretty okay. Much. So now, did you, how long have you guys been a couple. Okay. So we had, it was not necessarily, I would say, technical difficulties. It was the Lord that came through and told me that we have so much more content. You see what I'm saying? God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So as we are recording, um, I'm about I'm asking her the question, well, how long have you guys been together when I'm talking about the guy that she came in that that was her brother? And about two minutes of the end of our conversation didn't record. And she tells me, she goes, a month. And I'm looking at him and I'm looking at her and they're both smiling and I'm like, oh, this is new. And <laughs> I'm asking him some questions and finally I'm like, well, this is good. You want to come on the mic? So y'all didn't get the backstory of with the, the little two minutes, but we're going to start all over. So he's sitting over there and I'm looking at him and I'm like, well, how long have you guys been together? And you tell me, Melody, how long? One month. One month. Yeah. And then I said, well, she goes, well, we were friends first. And I thought, okay, for how long? And then I look at him and he said, oh, about one month. <laughs> right, right. So this is so new. And automatically me, assuming, and when you assume you get ass out of yourself every time and you just might be wrong, <laughs> I was like, well, he must be a virgin too. So what's your name? Let me introduce you. This is her, her man that walked in here. You know, he, I, I, maybe, oh, the camera turned off and I ran out of the I just thought I'd take a picture. He is very handsome. He's about seven foot two. No, I'm just kidding. How, how tall are you? I'm six seven. A six seven black man walking in here like he playing in the NBA. You know, he <laughs> you guys are just like a beautiful couple. So I said to you, do you disclose what you're saying? You said it was easy now. Just tell us again your name and stuff. Sure, yeah. My name is Reggie Huffman. And I'm um, glad to be on your show. Thank you. Yeah, and um, yeah, I'm a southern boy. And uh, are you from here as well? No, I'm from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, from the yeah from the deep south, and uh, and yeah, so we met um, on Facebook, and yeah, uh, I was doing I do I'm a minister, and oh. yeah, and so I was uh, I do lives on there as well. Um, okay. Basically, do you have uh, a church? Is that uh, a minister, does a minister have a church? Are you a pastor? No, I'm not a pastor. Yeah, I'm just a, I'm a minister. So I minister at churches. I do events, conferences. I just okay. yeah, like a kind of like a traveling evangelist, so to speak. You kind of look like. A better version of LeBron James. I get that all. You the get time. that? Yeah, yeah. He's a much cuter <laughs> version of Le- LeBron in the face. That's okay, so funny. go ahead. I'm looking at you now. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, so we met online, and I instantly, um, when I saw her, um, and obviously she, you know, her message is about her, her book and freedom, and um, you know, freedom, uh, from pornography. Um, I, you know, I immediately knew that, uh, she was a woman of God. You know, I'm saying a woman of substance, and. Uh, so, you know, in answer to your question, um, you know, in asking me, am I celibate? Um, certainly. 
Um, and it's, you know, due to um, my walk with God, you know, and I haven't always been, you know, I've been out there just like anybody else in them streets, you know, right. um, just doing what I want to do, living how I want to live. And I just got to a point where I was ready to change. And also I grew up in a church as well. So, mm-hmm. um, and so, yeah, you can grow up in a church and still be out there doing. You said you're 36, right? Thing. Yeah, I'm 36. So you're, she's 35, you're 36. How long uh, have you been celibate? Yeah, I've been celibate for about three years. Oh my God, I shouldn't have been drinking water when you said that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do you, wow. So you was, you know, out there doing you and then yeah. for, you just said, I'm going to, I'm walking with the right, Lord right. and I'm going to stop. Yeah. yeah. I've been like in and out of relationships. Oh my God. You guys are like that couple. What's their name? Oh, Megan Good. And her, oh, did y'all read that book? Uh, Not yet. I, I, want, I wanted to read that. Oh yeah. yeah. You should definitely read that book. Yeah. I haven't read it, but I heard it's good. I don't think yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah, I heard it. it's good too. Yeah. yeah. I'm not reading it. Um... Okay, so you meet him. It did so you kind of know a little bit about her story from her Facebook mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. from her online presence? Right, right. How did you guys connect? Yeah. Who 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 said who pinged who first? Who sent the DM first? Well, <laughs> I, I was doing my lives, and so I noticed she was like um, coming into my broadcast on uh, mm-hmm. Facebook message. So I'm like, who is this? You know, um, you know, and I was pretty much kind of you know trying to figure out who she was and learn more about her mm-hmm. immediately from that. And then, um, and then um, she hit me on Facebook Messenger, and I was like, okay. Um, and oh, you we, hit him first. She slid in yeah. the DMs first. She was <laughs> yeah. like, hey, minister. I was like, hey, I like your, I, I watch your lives all the time. I think they're really good, you know. And really was just like as a friend, just like trying to like connect right. to other people who was doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, we talked for how long? Yeah. Like, um, I, well, we we like did the face. We were messaging on Facebook for maybe like a little week. Maybe that not if even, that if that, that but I was like I need I need me. to I need to talk to her so I was like hey can I get your number <laughs> like you know I was like you know I'm trying to get to the Quit. bottom of this right <laughs> like I'm trying to figure out okay let's let's get to it like ain't no need wasting time and so yeah so she um she gave me a number and I was like cool and so I called her and the rest is we just we, and we just this rest, the rest of these weeks yeah. Yeah. these three weeks have been magical yeah it's been awesome I mean it's just yeah. about being on the same page you know just like mm. what you were saying earlier if you got people who who crackheads and they both do crack together they're gonna get along you got people who do music together and if you got mm-hmm. people who both in, into god and into their spiritual mm-hmm. growth they're gonna get along so you did know? you find out about the porn aspect of it from her facebook or did you melody go and tell him or during the the talking on the phone that it come out like how did it come out i know i told him i don't know if he had seen it on facebook um, but yeah, during our, during our conversations, I, I told him, I definitely told him. How do you tell us? Hey, so you're so cute. And I was listening to porn and, um, so I'm going to church tomorrow <laughs> on Sunday. You know, let's talk about Job's. How, like, how do you say that? Well, we were talking about our testimonies. Um, and I don't remember if I just said I wrote a book about my testimony and this is what it is. It's a great segue. Yeah. So yeah, I just, I just told him and we would, you know, talking, talking about our past, you know, what God has brought us through. And I was like, well, my testimony is kind of you know different but i was like i used to be addicted to pornography um for about eight years the lord delivered me and i remember he was just like well you know praise god you know and how did you take that you didn't think anything of it you said it's her past it's her past it's real like today transparency is the new currency you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. like real recognize real and so like i i have been no saint either you know what i'm saying so like that immediately resonated with me that she was a strong black woman who's not afraid of like what she's been through and what she's faced and i immediately couldn't like gravitate to that i asked her while i was setting up your mic i said well are you do you have that in common with her where you also first i thought you were a virgin you're not right. then i said well do you have the pornography in common with her and you said you watched it but were you yeah. addicted to it yeah no i wasn't like addicted um, you just enjoyed watching it yeah i just enjoy watching it and then i got to a point to where i understood like that wasn't a good a good road for me to go down like and like she said, well, like Melody mentioned, um, spiritual wise, it does. It's a spiritual thing. It does something to your spirit. And then, and, I mean, and yeah, I found myself when I was watching it. It did make me want to go further and further down. Okay, let me see what else is out there. What's going on? Right. And then I got to a point. I was like, you know what? I don't need to get into this because one thing about men, most men struggle if they realize if they admit it or not is commitment. Mm-hmm. And when you're mm-hmm. watching that pornography, that feeds into not being committed to anything because it's like boom you're watching it then you're watching something you're watching another woman you're watching you're watching another you know what i'm saying you right. watch another watch another and so and it's all so many different women and then you're trying mm-hmm. to be with one 
but right. you see <laughs> the black, the white, the right. Asian, mm-hmm. the one with the pigtails, right. the one with the straight, with the perfect body. Right. Who, yeah, and it's like, and, yeah. I be watching the wrong porn because sometimes I click on, I'm like, oh. That's just you nasty. That's just ugly. Yeah. Maybe some ugly ones out there too. Yeah, and, it, and like and like Melody was saying, it has a different effect on everyone. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, for me, I realized, man, this is not gonna help me trying to be committed to anybody. Like, right. and, and also my view of what a queen, you know, how I treat my queen, because what you know, being real, also is once you do get to that level of inti- you know, intimacy, um, in a, a marriage, you know, um, God, God willing, um. You don't want to come out the gate like on some. Uh, you trying to do some tricks that you've been watching, like you know what I'm saying. That, like, so that was actually and, a question I had yeah, for. That's, I'm and, going into that. Yeah, and that stuff is, and I'm just saying like that stuff is not natural because when people are feeding themselves with this, you know, um, pornography, or you know, their addiction, and then they're trying to um, come together with someone who you know they're in love with. You're going to go back. You're going to resort to what you've been feeding your mind with. And that's not going to be a natural interaction. That's how people be having these, you know, um, intimacies. That's not really organic. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. And so everybody just met jacked up mentally. What made you go places. celibate? Yeah. What made you go celibate? Um, the word of God. <laughs> like, okay. just, you know, just seriously being all the way real with myself. Like, you know, um, knowing, going, being in relationships that wasn't bringing me, um, like everything I was looking for, you know right. what I'm saying? I said, well, maybe I'm going about this the wrong way because in the world we live in today, you go out with somebody and you pretty much sleeping with them on the first or second date. Right. Just be 100, you know what I'm saying? So it clouds your judgment. It clouds your judgment. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's like, Oh, I, I think I like this person, but I don't know because now I didn't did this and did that. And then it just got to a point as a man, I'm just like, this ain't working. Like, you know, insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different mm-hmm. results. Right. So mm-hmm. yeah, I just, I mean, it wasn't easy. I'm not gonna lie to you. You know, it got real. It, it was, a, it, it got cold. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? Like that winter's that winter's real. You know? So you, are, you're com- both of you guys are committed to, there's no hanky panky <clears throat> until you get married. Yeah. Right. Now, right. I wanted to ask you, Melody, and I guess I can, well, you've been there in a way. You watch so much porn. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever watched, you've probably seen things I've never seen in porn. And you're seeing what we said, different women's, different men, different positions, all these different things. Now you're going to get married one day Mm -hmm. to a man. Because I was going to ask you that too. How do you know you're straight? But I guess you you know. Yeah, I know. Trust me. (laughs) Because that might have been another issue that's like, (laughs) oh, well, do I like women? Do I not? But. You know, you like your guy. Mm-hmm. So you're going to get married one day. How do you know you're not going to expect? Because you don't know what you're expecting. How do you know you're not going to expect or struggle with having the expectations of what you saw on TV? Um, Because for me, it was more like fantasy. And I knew that what I was seeing wasn't real. And um, I watched such like outrageous things to where like I know, like, honestly, I wouldn't even want to do that in real life. Cause it probably wouldn't even feel good in real life. Like I know these people but had to be like know. on drugs. No, some people really no, do like these... that. And I know, and mm-hmm. I'm so I have, which is complete opposite of my show. Um, my mm-hmm. really good friend has a show called horrible decisions and it's called mm-hmm. whore. So they talk about, mm-hmm. maybe that's not a show for you. So I wouldn't say go listen to it, but they talk about, well, maybe because it's liberation of sex within women. And women of mm-hmm. color. So, and they enjoy sex. So they're definitely not in the church and they don't, they're, mm-hmm. they're not in the church at all. They, they outside the church, but they're, they're good people. And they, as women, they enjoy it. So mm-hmm. they're like, why can't women enjoy these kind of things? Why can't a woman enjoy getting slapped or getting choked sometimes, or, you know, mm-hmm. taking charge? They do extreme things. And, but there are so many people in this world that really do enjoy it. Just like mm-hmm. in other worlds, they eat like duck eggs and the duck is almost, you know what I mean? Like food or they eat cow tongue and we're like, ew, who would ever like that? <laughs> the same thing with, I think, things that you might like within sex. So you really don't know what you will like or you won't like. I mean, I'll find out. But right. It's like- <laughs> but if you do so, but I feel like you're in your mind thinking because of the church, this is wrong. Like when I read in your book, you said BDSM is evil. So what if you do like that with your husband? What if you want to be blind? Well, you know what? I feel like this. And everything I do, I'm led by the Holy Spirit and my mm-hmm. conscience. So I just feel like if anything goes against that, then I'll know it. Okay. You know, then I'll know it. So it's, it's not a thing of like going into it like, okay, I can't do this, won't do that, can't do this and that. But it's like more I was worried like, for you about that. So my gosh, yes, you walk it's not going to be like that. Won't do it. Yeah, it's At not going to be try like, it. You got to try it. It's, it's not going to be like that. Like, okay. 
these are the strict rules. Right. I don't think no one's going to be like that, but um, definitely I feel like if something does not feel right, because even for those women you talked about with the show, um, Horrible Decisions, mm-hmm. I'm quite sure if anything, if they just get into a situation and it just does not feel right, they won't do it. They're not going to do it. No, they so do what they want. But they want to do as a woman. You so do maybe what they you may want. go a little further than what I would go. Or um, and like you say, I don't. They might experiment yet, more. I don't experiment may, as much as they do. Yeah. So everybody has their internal guide to tell okay. you, okay, if this is too much, or if it doesn't feel good, it don't feel good. But um, yeah. So, so you so you're not. You I'm not rigid about yourself. it. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not rigid about it, anything like that. But um, I am led by you know. Just um, the hope, the spirit of God within me to tell me, okay, this is too much, or just my own conscience, or just how I feel, like okay. So how yeah. long do you guys do you date to know that it's right? You just well, I'm putting y'all on the spot. A new ass <laughs> you relationship, just... you gonna walk out and be like, you better buy a ring, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you just uh, you just you just know, you just know. Like I mean, you know, I'm like I said, I'm 36. Like, right. what well, was like, your longest relationship before? Uh, before. Sh- a little over three years. Okay. Yeah. So you know, you kind of know what commitment is. Right, but... right, right. You, you know, you get to the point where you didn't seen it all. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, and so you just know, and that's why it's so importantly being equally yoked. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like someone who, you you know, you're both on the same page, you're into the same things. And, you know, the Bible gets, you know, people go in on the word, like, oh, the word is so restricted and it holds you back. But here's the great thing about it. It says in marriage, the bedroom is undefiled. So, you know, like all mm-hmm. these things that people are like, oh, well, if I get married, you know, and it's a spiritual man, and I'm with God and I can't do this and do that. Well, when you're in marriage, you can, it says, hey, if y'all both rock with this and y'all both like mm-hmm. that, the bedroom is undefiled. That's, that's one of the things that Bible said, hey, that's on you guys. That's right. between you two. And, um, and so, but yeah, it's just about um, being on the same path. Both growing, both um trying to both just loving God. That's what gravitated me to Melody. I knew she was she's she's real. She's transparent. She's not religious at all. I love the fact when she said she was um going to do your show. I was like, that's dope. You know what I'm so saying? I was, you <laughs> know, what I actually asked them about. I said, well, what do y'all say? The name of her show is Does it? S H I T. I'm thirty. <laughs> You know, so I was like, what do you think? And he was like, I think that's good because that'll help you, like, really reach a different audience. That's the audience you want to reach. Right. And it's, well, what audience? My thing to it is, like, when you think about it, it was more of the when I was about to turn it, I'm like, shit, I'm 30. It's your life. Because the point of the show is there's this this societal stigma that when you turn 30, you have to have your shit together. You need to have, mm-hmm. be married, have the kids, have the perfect career, you know, and I don't have none of that. No. So, but <laughs> did you feel, at least both of you, because you're in the 30s, did you feel like, shit, I'm 30, my stuff's not together? Yes. And we Definitely. shouldn't feel that way. Like, I yeah. was an accountant. I went to school for accounting. I got my degree. I have $65,000 in student loans, and I just quit my job as an accountant. And I said, I don't want to do this no more. Mm-hmm. And the other day, I had someone here for a consultation, actually. And she said, well, didn't you just go to school for accounting? And I said, yeah. She goes, what the hell? I said, that's the exact thing that everyone tells me and that's what i'm trying to get rid of if you mm-hmm. want to change your career and you find a new passion do it amen do it with right. calculated mm-hmm. risk right right mm-hmm. you, i didn't just up and quit one day you know but know that it's your passion and i was here working late nights and you know i i said that that was for me mm-hmm. so with anyone that's the, really the name of the show i put shit in there to grab your attention and it's mm-hmm. bad because i know everyone's mm-hmm. thought that in their mind shit you know, the first thing, well, I don't know about y'all, you, I don't know if you cuss sometimes in your head. I do, but I cuss out loud. And I was literally like, shit, I, am, I not, am I not good? I graduated a day before my 30th birthday. I took my, um, my last class, and I was still told I wasn't enough. Well, you didn't go right out to high school, so you're still mm-hmm. not good enough. Even wow. though you're doing all of this, and you're doing great, and you're a great mother, and your daughter is gifted, and she's doing all this, well, you got divorced. Wow. Um, or, but you had your daughter at 18. You were too, I did all these things, but... Everything that I've done, none of it to me, I felt like it was wrong. It was the right. path that God led me in. Yeah. And I, I know that I have a purpose. So mm-hmm. my purpose might be certain things. And like I said, I'm not religious in any way, shape, or form. And I don't go to church. I went, I think I went to church enough. I probably should go one day. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go one day. Not just not today. And I know that if you're a good person, if you believe, if you do things right, then he'll be there for you. You'll, you'll be all right. You're going to be all right. Anyway, mm-hmm. th- guys, you guys were great. You guys are so transparent. <laughs> That's going to get you somewhere. But we're going to go into it before we get, like, how to get a hold of you guys. Actually, you can stay with us to give us advice. Um, I do a segment called Unsolicited Advice, and basically I give advice to people who don't even fucking ask for it. So we're going to give it to them anyway, and they better listen. <laughs> That's the point of it. So the, this letter actually um, says, and it's really weird, and it caught my eye, and it has nothing to do with, like, what we were just talking about. Um, it, it threw me off, and I was like, this girl needs help. It says, at first, oh, wait. 
where's the beginning of it? Oh shit, hold on. Okay, so let her start saying, low key, I hate my beautiful five-year-old niece. And immediately I was like, well, you know, my okay. three-year-old nephew, he, I can't deal with him too often. Like I pick him up and I'll, he's hyper. He's the cute. I mean, he is gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous, awesome. He started talking, but he has too much energy for me. So I was like, yeah, I feel you. The five-year-olds don't stop. Like they're annoying. But then she said hate. And I was like, that's a strong word. I don't hate yeah. my nephew. I just think he's a lot. So it starts saying. At first, I thought she just bugged me, quote unquote. When she was a newborn, I had no problems babysitting her all the time. But the minute she hit two, I started to find her annoying. The other day when I saw her run up, run up to me and hug me tight, it hit me that I'm jealous of a five-year-old. And worse, in my head, I didn't say jealous. I said hate. I hate that she's beautiful and that all of our uncles and aunts love her while I remember being called ugly as a child. I hate that everywhere she goes, she makes friends while I struggled so hard to make friends growing up. I hate that she's accepted so easily in the all-white school when I didn't, and I used to make myself feel better by saying they're racist when she's black, too. I hate that she can barely speak properly at five and people aren't concerned because she has her looks. I hate that my beautiful dumb cousin now has a beautiful child and lives with a man who takes care of her while I'm in my 20s without even having a boyfriend. I hate that I know she's going to have such an easy life when I'm still struggling. Side note, I'm not exaggerating when I say she's beautiful. She has the most perfect features, unique eye shape, button nose, full lips already, hairs to her armpits and naturally curly, but straightens so easily. Gorgeous smile. The damn Denton says she probably won't even need braces. And on top of that, a bubbly personality. Even when she was a baby, she would just laugh and smile at her every damn thing. Ugh, I need to stop comparing myself to her, guys. Why is life not fair? My God. Wow. I read this, yeah. I said, what the hell? And immediately, to me, I was like, um, this is nothing to do with this baby. Yeah, This right. is yeah. all <laughs> this to all do her. with you. Yeah. You have a problem with your skin color. You have a problem with your hair. You have a problem with your speech. You have a problem with the way you... This is all problems that you're seeing within yourself, mm-hmm. and you're projecting them onto this little girl because yeah. she has the confidence. Five-year-olds are not quote-unquote confident they just living without thinking about the judgment of other people mm-hmm. so i think first of all you don't have an issue with this look she even called her cousin beautiful and dumb she's dumb because she has a beautiful baby and she's beautiful you're probably just as beautiful and you're not yeah. confident within right. yourself yeah because right. like you have long hair okay use some oils get that miracle grow oil hair <laughs> put a wig on baby you see cardi b wears wigs all day you know there's so many things that we can mm-hmm. do and beauty is one beauty is in the eye of the beholder for me for sure yes right. Yeah. Right. and two like, beauty is on the inside. For sure. How you speak to people, how you project yourself. I've seen plenty of girls, because I know in our society, big girls, quote unquote, people are like, oh, big girls aren't beautiful. Big, There's some big girls out mm-hmm. there. Uh, they are so beautiful. And that comes because of the way they carry themselves. The yeah. same way I've seen plenty of model-looking chicks, that the mo- moment they open their eyes, they walk by, I'm like, bitch, you ugly. Like, there's nothing cute about you. You're disgusting. I would never want you in my presence. You know, I'd rather have a woman that is confident that to walk up next to me so i just said you just you're broken inside you're yeah, dark inside she has some major some major like self-esteem things going on right. even how she said um i know that she's gonna have an easy life you don't know that you don't number know one. That. And then the thing is she could possibly grow up because the, the one who wrote this letter she could be beautiful could look just like i'm her, sure um, she is it's yeah her cousin is her family you, yeah you she might be beautiful, beautiful too and a little girl can grow up and have that same type of low self-esteem you can't think just, just because she looks good to you that she's gonna feel like she looks good her, you know she looks she's right. good for herself but um i think there's self-esteem issues and maybe she's not i'm wondering what is she doing with her life is she doing anything not a damn thing, probably. She can't send at home looking at pictures of this little baby. That's what I'm thinking. She needs to get busy with her purpose, you know, with whatever plan um, God has Something for her. Something has life. to have happened to her. Yeah. At one point in time, maybe some ugly ass boy with a little pee pee and told you that you weren't cute and he had problems with himself mm-hmm. because he had a little yank and now he mad, you know? A <clears> man <throat> probably put that onto you or another woman mm-hmm. or your mother mm-hmm. or your father or a cousin. Someone told you something one day and you believed it. Yeah. And it wasn't true. And I feel like it's so easy to feel down because with social media nowadays, everybody photoshops, everybody's yep. wearing 30 inch weaves. Mm-hmm. Um, like even I was scared to go back curly because when I took the pictures for this, I was wearing my weave and I was bleach blonde and I had all this and I was like, damn, I don't even look the same anymore. 
I'm going to go back natural. And to me, I'm like, what are people going to think? And then I said, that only lasts about five seconds. I said, the hell? I don't care. They're going to have to take me the way that I am. But for a second, mm-hmm. I thought about what others yeah. might think. So she's clearly looking at what somebody else thinks and believed yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me ask this. Is, is Denise uh, still, was the, is she grown now? Because she said something about she got a boyfriend that take care of her. That um, she's like she got a man to take care of her. Is that the cousin? Or that the oh, cousin? Oh no, the cousin. Oh, that's the, the mom. Cousin. The oh, mom okay, of the okay. baby. The mom of the baby. Right. Okay. 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 So she's so, jealous so, of the mom. So she, so she really jealous of this little. Girl. She's yeah. jealous of the girl. She's like, jealous of the a, mom. Is this a real letter? Uh, uh, yeah. It's wow. just like wow. You and you're only in your twenties. Right. I don't know if it's early twenties. I don't know if it's late twenties. But this shouldn't happen at, at, at not any in your twenties. Yeah. But, not any time, but definitely not in your twenties where you're still basically perfect at that time too. And it's a fire that baby yeah. probably think about the fact that baby probably still pees on herself in bed you know <laughs> how glamorous is that she peed her bed you know but she's a kid yeah that's yeah that this is just a child and it's like she yeah. can't she said something about she speaks well and people aren't concerned because she has her looks looks don't do anything for you like looks might get you maybe let's say to someone in the door. It gets you in the door, right? Then once right. you get in that door and you open that mouth and that per- it gets you right back out. Right, right. That- not at five though. She's saying she has her look like what is she trying to do at five? Exactly. Oh, then steal that's, somebody toy. Yeah. Right. She might get extra cookies, <laughs> but I'm sure that's because <laughs> she's not she's cute, but she's nice too. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know she might get an extra scoop of ice cream at school. I don't know something <laughs> like that. But are you? Do you want ice cream? Buy your own goddamn cookie. You're in your twenties. There's nothing this little girl is not getting yeah. that you can't get your goddamn yeah. self. Yeah, I think this definitely speaks to uh, that that woman who wrote the letter childhood. Like she definitely had, a, yeah, yeah, she definitely had a trouble issues. in childhood because she's yeah. looking at her niece's childhood and she's already jealous of the life she's seeing her niece lives and experiencing. Mm-hmm. So, so, I mean, even nowadays, when you think, when I look back at the pictures of me as a kid, maybe she's mad because she was an ugly baby. I wasn't even that cute. I had a unibrow. And then I look, when I was 13, I was a hot mess. And I look at my daughter and her friends. And these girls have the hair laid. They know how to do uh-huh. makeup. They, she knows how to put my lashes on. And I'm like, man, these 13 year olds are cute. I was ugly as hell. You know, I, I looked like a boy. I wanted to be a boy. And I'm like, am I going to be mad at them for being cute? I mean, sometimes I look at them and I'm like, ugh, get out of my face. But it's just <laughs> me just, you know, being funny with them. And I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. they're really pretty. And th- times have changed. But something had to have happened. My thing yeah. is go to therapy. I think she needs therapy. Yeah, she has some healing that needs to take place. Definitely. Yeah, and she's yeah. a black girl, so I'll suggest for sure the same way I found my therapist is black therapy for black girls. And that's a podcast, and she also has a directory. So I, I tried therapy, and I've mentioned this on the show before. I tried a uh, white lady. That didn't quite work out. I tried a gay Hispanic. Um, That didn't work out. I tried an older black man, and he kept staring at my feet. And it was weird, and he was like smirking, and I'm the white lady. We didn't have much. I had to sit there and explain for an hour what I meant when I said certain things. And she'd be like, "Oh, what was that again?" She didn't understand the way I spoke, and I'm like, "Ma'am, we I'm not gonna spend a whole hour explaining to you what I mean about certain things or what certain things are." So I went to Black Girls Therapy, and I'm not black. I'm actually Puerto Rican, but I grew up here. I went to school mm-hmm. in Eatonville with Shaquana, so that's yeah. that's where I I've resonated and w- what I've it's a I think it's a more of a cultural thing for me and Mm -hmm. um i found a therapist there and she's around my age she has a 13 year old son and she every time i say something although i'll say some off the wall shit sometimes and she'll either laugh or be like oh damn you know she understands me Mm -hmm. and from there we can talk about it i don't have to explain my feelings so i think she needs to go maybe to black girl therapy or girl therapy for black girls i think it's called and find you a therapist that you and it'll it'll take time it took me four Mm -hmm. to find the right one but find the right one and I bet you she don't even go to church because there's nothing get. Mm-mm. I think if you go to church, you might have known not to be mad at a five year old. Yeah, she yeah she needs some healing and she needs to kind of get busy. I feel like she's not doing anything. Yeah, she got too much time to be running about the five year old ones. Yeah, she ran about a five year old. She definitely knows. She's not doing nothing. She's not doing too much. To- uh, <laughs> so the next segment is one that I call shit talk. And either something happened to me or I read something and I'm like, oh, I want to talk shit about this. And I'm actually, it's, I didn't even know this, this all came together so well because it's a woman that farted in a store and pulled the knife on the, the next customer and got charged and went to jail. So I was, <laughs> as I'm reading it, she was at a dollar store in line and she didn't let one go. She let one go. And the guy behind her, I guess, was like, damn, like, you stink. And started talking about it. And she pulled out a knife and, like, made motions. And they arrested her. She went to jail. And it was, she got charged with, like. She's a black lady? Yeah. Did you see this? Because it happened Uh here in Florida. 
I, of listen, course, of course, it happened in of Florida. Of course, it happens yeah. in Florida. That's the, that's where we have like the craziest people. Mm-hmm. And when I'm reading on it, I said, "Well, man, first of all, I was like, why did it have to happen in Florida? It could have been like Connecticut or Mm-mm. somewhere else." She looked a little rough too. She looked like she was mad about something. She's 37 years old. She was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon without the intent to kill. So she went to bail. The bail was set at $2,500. They call her the alleged colon culprit. <laughs> I thought that was pretty fucking funny. She just, she let one rip. And they got into, so it says uh, Walker got into a verbal argument with the guy in reference to the defendant farting loudly. It was loud and it stunk. So when I thought about it, I said, well, you know what? This reminds me of the fact that the other day I was, I've been with my boyfriend for five and a half years. And Mm -hmm. I have never actually let one go in front of him intentionally. Now I was married also for a really long time. And with my I would just fart on his leg on purpose, just for the hell of it. <laughs> I would do I would do dumb shit like that. Like I don't know if you follow, you guys probably don't follow me on Instagram, but even this morning sometimes I I suffer with um, uh, what's it called when you can't poop? Constipation. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I can't go to the bathroom, and when I do, it's a fucking celebration, and everybody's gonna party with me, and I'm gonna post about it, and y'all gonna see that I'm there, and clap clap with me, and you know be happy for me. <laughs> so that's that's how transparent I am. Hilarious. And now I get I get people send me pictures when they're going, and I was like, you know, let me know how you're doing. Let, I want to know that your stuff's going good over there too. Yeah. So, anyways, I've never done anything in front of him intentionally. Maybe in my sleep, and I don't know about it. I do remember one time something happened. I think he was tickling me. I'm pretty sure I let one go, but he never said anything. Mm. And then the problem is that he won't do it in front of me either. It's been five and a half years, so I've heard him in the bathroom, and I try to pick at him to see if he'll like get over. I, he's he's kind of shy. He's quiet and shy. He won't do, he won't say anything. Yeah. And I'm like, why can't I just go? I just want to, you know, pass gas, poop, release a little air biscuit, cut the cheese, something. But he'd be like, no, don't do that. Or he'll look at me and he'd be like, but why? Why can't you just go in the bathroom? And I'm like, well, why can't I just do it here? Like sometimes he'll do it in the bed. And I know he knows he'd do it because I walk in and it smells like <laughs> rotten. And I'm like, bro, you let one go? Then he just looks at me dumb, won't even speak. Like he don't speak English. Oh, so now you don't understand me. It stinks in here. So you're going to act like you didn't just fart. And he, he won't say where he just looking. He'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. All of a sudden now you can't breathe. But anyways, my thought was, when is it okay to do it in a relationship? I think it, you should be open about things. You should just tell somebody, hey, you know, I, I got to poop. It's a natural thing. And this woman, I feel like she went to the Dollar Tree. She was in line. She had to let it go. And she just let it go. She let it rip. And I feel like now my boyfriend comes back from North Carolina tonight. He's only been gone for a day, but I got to let him know I'm going to rip one right in front of you. And I'm going to make you smell it. Because her confidence gave me confidence to know that it's, it's natural. And if you got to let one go, you should let one go. So now y'all just been together for a month. And see, I'm going to help you out so it doesn't take five and a half years like it's taking me. Do you think it's cool to just fire in front of somebody? Personally, I... <laughs> my thing is, I, I, I wouldn't mind if I didn't have to smell it. I just feel like if you can kind of like walk away then for me, then walk away. You know so what I'm saying? Being, well, I guess Try like, to be po- kind of polite. But if you can't help it, you can't help it. But you have some people who just let it rip. Yeah, and it, think, it, it and it's feels like, great. I feel like yeah. you shouldn't hold it. I heard it's bad for you. Cause see, my dad was the type of man that we'd be at the table, and my dad would do one of these, like lift the leg up and just see. Uh, it would go, that like right towards me. I'd be like, really? Oh, he would do it while we eat. He would do it, but so did my mom. So everybody would just fight. It was like a eating. family thing. Well, my dad would be the one while we were eating, and it was so rude. But we just got used to it. I burp a lot, but yeah, I just th- th- when you were in your three and a half year relationship, did you do it? <laughs> No, not in uh, not just let one go. Yeah, cause no, no. I mean, cause <laughs> you that, weren't comfortable. With I mean, cause the flowers start dying, stuff starts laying over. I mean, you, know, <laughs> you got you there. You know, it's it, it, it's it, it's it's uh it's drastic. So no. you have to understand the potency of uh oh, of oh, what oh, you oh. carry. <laughs> Listen, and let me tell you, if I still love my boyfriend to this day, it means it doesn't matter. So I'll tell you this from experience. Yeah, it don't matter because he smells like there's something dead inside of him. Yeah. And I'm still here. Right. Sometimes right, I wonder if we right. need to go to the hospital. Like you, something's got to be wrong. You strong. You strong. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should. My father, my mom did it. So shout out to Shanetta Yvette Wilson. She's the real MVP. I feel I, everyone should be more like her. Just not if I'm behind you in line. I'm not sure if I want to smell everybody. But if it happens, it happens. And I'll never yeah. judge anyone else mm-hmm. for yeah. farting around me. I agree. Yeah. I do it in the car with my daughter and I lock the windows. Mm. See, uh-uh. I think I think that is the funnest game to play. So when you have yeah. your, your when you have kids, 
Do it and lock the windows. <laughs> See, and that's things you do too, like especially growing up among siblings and stuff like that. Because you know you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get them. You're gonna get them. Yeah, you so, gotta get them. You yeah. know, uh, you know, but it's to each his own. Everything, every relationship is different. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So, so recently, my my shit talk goes to those people that like shame others for you know things that are all natural. If you naturally <laughs> have to go, you have to let it go. Just let it go and then say sorry later. It'll go, it goes away. It's not like it lingers for too long. Five minutes max. That's oh if it, that's if oh you had no. a lot that of cheese the day oh before. God. Yeah. That was cheese. And if you haven't pooped in a while. But you know, if you poop and like you fart right after, it don't smell. So you're good. That's that's something I'm I never knew that. That's a that's a yeah, fun, that's right a fun at, fact. Fun fact. Right after you take a poop, if you fart, maybe within like the next twelve hours, is it usually doesn't smell like anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my daughter gets worried. She's like, Did you poop yet when you fart? And I'd be like, I did. She's like, Oh yeah, you did. It doesn't smell. Great. Anywho. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're done with that one, the point of that was everyone should be more like uh, Mrs. Wilson. My thing, um, let everyone know where they can find you, your book when it's releasing, where they can see your lives, because I see you go on live a lot, all of that. All right, so you can find me on MelodyShakia.com. I'm going to tag it on iTunes as well. Okay, so MelodyShakia.com, that's my website. Also, the book is called Life After Freedom from Pornography Addiction. All right, so it's mainly for women. But I would say if men want to pick it up and read it or give it to someone you know and love, then that's cool too. I think it's um, good for men to read it too. Or you didn't. I've had a few men read it, and they say it was very helpful for men too. All right. Um, so the book will be released on January twenty eighth, but it's available for pre order right now at MelodyShakia dot com, and it will ship ship on January eighteenth if you pre order it. Nice. And did you? Are you self publishing this? It's all on your own. Self publishing. Yes, girl. Yeah. All them coins go to you. <laughs> so you guys, I feel like it's not only pornography, but if you're addicted to anything, I feel like it would help. It's a it's a story mm-hmm. of someone that you can resonate with and you can mm-hmm. understand, and you know it goes with you. Do you have yeah. social media that you want people to follow you on? Yes, you can follow me on Instagram um, at Melody Shakia. Find me on Facebook. Search Melody Shakia. Also YouTube Melody Shakia. What about yeah. yourself, sir? Do you have? Because yeah. I you said you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook, uh, Reggie Huffman. Uh, you can also can find me on Instagram on the Reggie Huffman fifty one and on Periscope. Periscope still around? Yeah, Periscope is still around. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, Periscope yeah. is popping. Yeah. Is it? Apparently. Oh, yeah. What do you do on Periscope? Um, you can. Well, I do um, broadcasts where I'm basically like teaching. Um, on the word. So it's like a like live? That. Yeah, you're doing like a live broadcast just like on Facebook or Instagram oh. and it has a whole different uh, audience. Like it's a whole different vibe on Periscope. Um, you know, but people use it for uh, teaching, for cooking. Uh, a lot, you have a lot of people who uh, have have really popped on um, doing like cooking shows on Periscope and they're in the kitchen. They got their, you know, they got their <laughs> broadcast set up and oh, they so got like hundreds like, of people watching them. That's so dope. Yeah. Hmm. I really did not know they were around. I know my boyfriend would do Periscope when he was at his races. And I was just like, what the hell is this Periscope? You talking to girls? You talking to girls? Let me uh, see. But it wasn't. I didn't understand what it was. Think about Periscope. You really got to grind Periscope because um, you have to cultivate that audience. So, like, mm-hmm. if you go live, you ain't nobody. Well, that's like anywhere. Like, like Instagram, mm-hmm. Facebook, you go live and it's, you have to get people to get used to seeing your lives mm-hmm. and get entertained. Yeah. Well, anyways, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. You guys were amazing. Thank, thank you. you for being open and transparent <laughs> and letting me talk and... I, I was scared because, again, I come from the church and some people will be like, oh, but you curse and you do all that. And I know that, I, but I don't change for anyone. And I have my cousin who's a pastor and he lets me talk the way I talk. And at the end of the day, he knows there's no ill will intent for me. So thank you so much for letting me be myself and not judging me. Um, and thank you for coming on. <laughs> thank right. you for having me. Oh, Appreciate there's one more us. thing I had to do. I told everyone how important it is because I need you guys to go on iTunes, rate, subscribe, and review the podcast it helps me a lot. And you guys have been doing great. So every week I was going to, I've been reading someone's review. And this week I'm going to read a review from, I'm going to read this one. I haven't read it. I, I saw it and I'm like, you know what? I actually know who it is. And her name is Jessie Journey Through Cancer. I had no idea mm-hmm. she had a journey. And I, from the job that I just quit, she worked there. And I didn't mm-hmm. meet her until I put my, uh, meet her, meet her until I put in my two weeks notice. And her,